Well, we'd like to welcome everyone. Um, this, as you know, is the James A. McKee Association. Please come in and be comfortable. You can have a seat. As a matter of fact, right here. <laughs> there wasn't. All right. Uh, my name is Karen McKee. I am currently the president of the James A. McKee Association, and I want to welcome everyone this uh, morning for coming to join us. Before we actually get started on our program, I have just a few announcements that I would like to share with the group. I have uh, a few handwritten copies that I can pass out a little later on. The first announcement is that the Yellow Springs school system has recently created a facilities uh, management team, a committee of people, and what they're asking people to do is to go online to the Survey Monkey to answer a three-question survey about the Yellow Springs buildings, what you think we need. This is a follow-up from last year's uh, levy that was defeated by the, uh, in the election. So they're trying to get a clearer sense of what the community sentiment is about the school building. And um, let me give you, in a minute, I'm going to give you their, uh, ah, I'm sorry, I don't have that with me. Um, it's a survey monkey, and there is a website, which I'll be writing up here in a minute, because I'm sorry, I don't have it on my notes. The second announcement is a very important announcement. The Village of Yellow Springs has created a citizens committee to help with identifying the new village manager. As many of you may know, uh, Patty Bates will be retiring soon, and so they're in the process of finding a replacement. And part of that process is going to involve community forums, the first of which will be on April the 10th, which is a uh, Wednesday evening, and that uh, forum is a community forum open to the public. It will be at 6.30 in the evening at Bryan Community Center in the gymnasium. So you're really encouraged to try and please come out and not only meet the candidates, but also to ask questions. So bring your questions with you um, to that forum. If you're not able to come to the Wednesday evening forum, the following morning on Thursday at 8.30 in the morning at the Yellow Springs uh, Senior Center downtown, there will be a second informal community forum where again you'll have an opportunity to come in and uh, meet the, uh, the candidates and ask questions. So again, I want to encourage you guys to do that. The last announcement that I want to say this morning is please mark your calendars for um, April the 28th. This organization is going to be celebrating its 25th anniversary and we have combined that celebration with our annual Founders Award. Uh, we every year provide uh, or identify a outstanding community service, either individual, organization, and in this case we have a couple, Roger and Macy Reynolds, who many of you may know, who have uh, been very involved in the community, volunteering in a number of uh, capacities. So it will be at the Mills Park Hotel. There are. Uh, it's $45 per person. I'd like for people to RSVP by April the 19th by sending your checks to the James A. McKee Association at Post Office Box 263 here in Yellow Springs. The information is in the newspaper and you will be getting additional information um, as you are going around signing up. One of the reasons we like to have your contact information so that we can be able to provide you with this information. Um, the last thing I just said, that the one more thing, we every year have a scholarship award that we provide <coughs> to the uh, graduating senior of Yellow Springs High School. And the applications are currently available. You can get those through the Yellow Springs School. The deadline is uh, the 5th of April. So if you know of a deserving high school graduate that would be uh, able to benefit from a uh, scholarship, a small scholarship, it's $1,500 this year, then please encourage them to contact their guidance counselor. Not only the high school, but it also includes uh, Green County Career Center as well. So, 
Without further ado, I would like to kind of go around and introduce ourselves. As I said, my name is Karen McKee. <laughs> Sir, would you begin and then we'll go around and introduce ourselves and then I'll turn the program over to Don. <coughs> Go ahead, Ted. Oh. <laughs> Ted Campbell. Chris Zerbuki. John Fleming. Karen Woodrow. Excuse Bruce me. Bruce Trickenbox. Dan Carrington. Katie Anderson. Gary Wireson. Jim Johnson. Karen McKee. Carl Hyde. Kellyanne Tracy. Mary Ann McQueen. Bob Harris. Dave Huntington. Peg Beers. Don Hollister. Bob Baldwin. Abby Williams. Sam Eckenrode. Hello, Dave Turner. Yeah. Hello. Uh, we advertised this uh, community conversation uh, about the <coughs> Yellow Springs housing market, current trends and just perspectives uh, to be presented or led by Craig Meesher. He cannot be here. And on the spur of the moment, yesterday afternoon, <laughs> Sam Eckenrode, Sam Williams Eckenrode, agreed to uh, pick this up. And I'm impressed with your quick preparation. Uh, Sam grew up in Yellow Springs. Uh, her mother, Bambi, is here. Uh, Sam went to Antioch School, went to Yellow Springs School, and graduated from Antioch College in 1983. Uh, she owns Sam and Eddie's bookstore. And how long have you been a realtor? Since 2004, so 15 years. And she was around another realtor, Bambi Williams, <laughs> for a few years before that. <laughs> Mom was first licensed in 1971. So from 1971 to 2004, I heard a lot about real estate. <laughs> so Sam, do you want to take over? <laughs> well, thank you. It's, it's an honor to be with all of you, and especially with you, Karen, because I was a big fan of your father. Thank you. And um, I consider myself one of the children of of um, Chief McKee because he was such a terrific role model and he led with love and it showed and I, I, I love it when we are able to find people in Yellow Springs who do that and, and especially in, in a little sometimes contentious village it can be quite challenging and so I, I deeply respect Chief McKee and it's an honor to be here in his memory. Thank you. Um, so I did throw this together rather quickly, and I'd like to first announce that I have a chronic cough, which is related to allergies. I'm allergic to the state of Ohio, <laughs> and, and when I cough really hard, uh, this is the first time it's happened, I separated a rib, and so I brought pillows. If I really have to cough, I might grab some pillows because the my doctor is going to pop the rib back into place tomorrow. <laughs> but in the time being, I'm, I'm in fear of coughing. So just please bear with me. And I promise I'm not contagious unless okay. allergies are contagious. So um, <coughs> growing up in mom's household, um, mom's mom was a big fan of real estate and used to read from the property transfers and the papers um, when mom was a child. And I grew up listening to lots of behind the scenes stuff in Yellow Springs. And it wasn't until I got my license in 2004 that some of the things that I've been hearing for 30 years started to, you know, make sense. And so I made this not very high tech little uh, illustration of our sweet little village, which as you can see in the state of Ohio is tiny, and these are all from Wikipedia or Google Maps, and then, so you see where we're located in Ohio, and then you see in Greene County where we're located in Greene County, and then the next map is a pretty good 
rendering of where we are in relation to the parks. I say parks because of Glen Helen and the Gorge and John Bryan. Um, and then um, in my shop at Sam and Eddie's, one day Hardy Ballantyne and his wife came in and they had seen a bumper sticker somewhere that they wanted recreated. And they, they asked me if I could do it in honor of, of Hardy's 70th birthday. They wanted a bumper sticker made that said, uh, Yellow Springs, Ohio, 1.9 square miles surrounded by reality. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you see those bumper stickers, that's the origin of those. Um, we had them made up for Hardy's birthday, and, and now we still sell them in town. And that's how I came up with our 1.9 square miles. And then <coughs> the, the last little map is how I have come to think of our village. Um, Mom taught me some history and demographics and helped me understand that um, the village was founded somewhere around 1820 and the old trail tavern was kind of the heart of the village because we were on the Cincinnati Pittsburgh stagecoach trail. And um, because we were on that trail, we became a stopping point along the way for people heading north or south, particularly heading north because um, African Americans who crossed the Ohio River um, into technical freedom but not safety often had to continue traveling north to get wherever they were going. And so very early on in Yellow Springs' history, because it had been founded by Quakers and Utopianists, uh, became known as a safe haven for, for a stopping point on the trek, the Great Migration North. So um, by the time Horace Mann came through, we had a railroad. Oh, and the railroad, many of you probably know, almost went through Clifton. Uh, there was, I guess, a, a big political battle <laughs> and a long time ago, and we ended up with the railroad, which is now our bike path. And um, that's why Horace Mann and other tourists <coughs> came through in the early to mid 1800s because there was a spa in Glen, in, in the Glen, what's now the Glen. Uh, the remnants are still there. And um, when Horace Mann came through, what he found was a small town that was already diverse and progressive and interesting and just felt like a good place to be. And he envisioned uh, founding his college to face what was then the train uh, tracks and uh, decided to found Antioch College in the 1850s. So, <coughs> excuse me, so our town really started with that kernel um, with the, the spa and the stagecoach inn and then expanded to include the college and many houses were built by um, bricklayers and builders who came from the east imported by Horace Mann and his family. So um, one of the things I've loved about working in real estate is getting to work with really interesting people. And one interesting person I got to work with was Carl Cologne, who's the director of the Green County Public Library System. And he had lived here he had lived in the Columbus area previously and loved Yellow Springs. And when he came, he knew he needed to be able to get on 675 quickly and get to all eight branches of the Greene County Public Library. But he also wanted to be sure that, and, and he knew he loved Yellow Springs. He thought he wanted to live in Yellow Springs, but he'd heard it was very expensive. He wasn't sure they'd be able to find the kind of housing they needed here. So he and his wife came and devoted two days, one to Beaver Creek and one to Yellow Springs, and looked for a suitable house to settle and raise their family. 
Um, we, we did Beaver Creek first, and then Yellow Springs second. And at the end of the two days, um, Carl said something that I often quote now. He said, both communities had a lot to offer. There was no question that it was a hard decision for him and his wife. But um, Beaver Creek struck him as sort of like a big patchwork quilt. You had a square here, and then another square, and another square, and it just kept on going and kept on going. And sometimes we would look at one house that they could afford, and then go to the next house on their list that they could afford, and drive for 20 minutes, still in Beaver Creek, just to get from one house to another. So, and, and we also noticed that there were often seams, actual seams on the pavement between, from neighborhood to neighborhood. And some of those squares on the crazy quilt had access to gas and others only access to electric. It was, it was pretty much a classic example of sprawl and no central downtown. Yellow Springs, on the other hand, he said, reminded him of a little crochet doily. <laughs> and, and that doily, seemed to radiate outward, almost like a sunrise, from downtown. And so that's how I came up with this little diagram down here, because often buyers will come and fall in love with the town and say, we, we love the town, we love the people, we love so many things that the village has to offer, um, but we'd like to be very close to downtown. and then they start to list things that they'd like. They'd like a newer home with a three-part garage <laughs> and uh, you know, maybe some extra land so they can plant a big garden and you know, all this within like, you know, half a block of the whatever, the little art theater. <coughs> and I have to explain to them that most of those properties were bought up between 1820 and 1950. And so now we're at a stage in our village's development where um, in real estate it's called buildings outliving their economic value or outliving their economic potential. And a classic example of that in, um, in my appraisal class when I was getting licensed was a big McDonald's that was I think at the corner of 48 and 725, or maybe it was 741 and 725. And it had been a McDonald's since McDonald's had started. And one day the McDonald's was torn down and it was a really busy, prominent Dayton corner. And there was a lot of speculation about what would go up where that McDonald's had been. And people watched and waited and guess what went up there? McDonald's. A new McDonald's, <laughs> yeah, with with a you know an appropriately sized drive-through and the new equipment, and so unfortunately we're kind of becoming we're getting to that stage in Yellow Springs because some of the really really early dwellings are now in such disrepair that um, really their main value is in their lot and location, and so you see some teardowns happening. It's always sad when we see that, but if the structures are mostly wooden <coughs> and haven't been kept up and are past 150 years old, it's not that unusual in any market for those hard decisions to have to be made. So, um, so the quadrants that I think of with on the doily the, the doily of the rising sun, because we're, we're very fortunate that our village planners have thought ahead and created a beautiful green belt around the village, which is what creates the edges of our, our doily. Um, when people say that they want to be close to downtown, I tell them that we're only one point 1.9 square miles anyway, so anywhere is fairly close to downtown. And um, Char Schiff is a local example. Do, does anybody know Char Schiff? Yeah. 
Yeah, Char, Char lives um, in what's known as Birch 2, and she rides her scooter downtown often, and she, she's a wonderful role model because she makes sure that she can get downtown almost every day when she's in town, even though she has some walking difficulty, um, as many people do. So we, in real estate, we, we're not allowed to say that something is within walking distance of something or not, because we need to think about all different abilities, and we work with everybody, and so we have to be careful about our language and our advertising. Um, let's see. So uh, what I've labeled central is roughly from Allen Street on the south to Dayton Street, or <coughs> maybe Fairfield Pike on the north, and then I'd say around High Street on the, uh, to the west. And then when my parents came to town in the late 50s, um, my dad came to teach at Antioch. And they had trouble finding housing, as pretty much my, the, the legend has it that ever since Lucy and Arthur Morgan arrived in town and um, tried to decide how to rebuild the college at that time in 1920, Lucy was a, a great proponent of housing. Um, and this is something I remember from my childhood. Mom helped Antioch College a lot with their property holdings, and she taught me that Lucy thought it was very important that um, if, if you had an opportunity to design a bathroom, you should design it so that no one could open the door and see somebody sitting on the toilet. You should open the door and the door should hide whoever might be <laughs> um, in a compromising position. So there are some houses on Davis Street and Whiteman <coughs> Street that Lucy Morgan helped the college arrange to have built or built. Um, and one of the characteristics of those houses on those streets is that it has a, a very thoughtfully positioned toilet in the bathrooms. <laughs> but Lucy, I think it was in around the 40s, Lucy wrote a little chapbook about housing in Willow Springs. And I've not actually read that chapbook yet, but I've Talk to Scott Sanders and Nina Maya about it. Um, Scott Sanders is the current curator of Antiochiana, and Nina Maya was his former was the former many years curator of Antiochiana and trained Scott. And um, they both knew that Lucy was known for her concern about what would happen to the town when we rebuilt the college where were all the professors going to live? So some of the housing developments in the south end um, are called Birch 1, Birch 2, and Birch 3. And that's because Arthur Morgan, Charles F. Kettering, and his wife Olive, and, and Arthur Morgan's wife Lucy, and um, Hugh Taylor Birch, who became a great friend of Lucy and bought the Len for the town, also bought three huge soybean fields. And Birch One was, it consisted of what we now know as President Street and um, uh, Rice Road, Rebecca Rice Street or Rice Road. Um, that was all Birch One. And then Birch 2 starts, there's a scene there too on the pavement. Uh, Birch, the Birch 2 development starts on Quarry Street and runs all the way up Quarry Street to Hyde Road and then up Glenview and Birch Streets. And that's Birch 2. And then you're probably all familiar with Birch 3, which is the most <coughs> interior of the, of the three Birch tracks. And the reason they're called Birch 1, 2, and 3 is because Hugh Taylor Birch paid for the, that land, but he did so with the vision of um, the Morgans and the Ketterings um, in planning for the village. 
um, my parents <coughs> built a little tiny home on Gardendale Drive before I came along. I, I was born in 1961, but I think you got here in 1957? That's about right. Mm -hmm. And at that time, a development called Fair Acres was going up. Um, and those were <coughs> smaller lots, smaller homes, and um, many, many people who couldn't afford bigger lots and homes decided to take the plunge and try and risk building. And so that's how the Fair Acres uh, subdivision started. Where does that um, again? What, what part of town is? Fair that Acres? would be um, north of Fairfield Pike. Okay. And uh, that I, I always thought that north of there. Okay. North of Gardendale, the, the white Whitehall. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Look at that. that yeah. Point. So that's it's north right end. next yeah. to Alice, uh, Alice Park. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know it was whole period. That was whole period. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then around the same time, an, a visionary African American named Omar Robinson who was my dad's next door neighbor and a really um, <coughs> amazing guy. He was an engineer at the base at Wright Pat. He, uh, there was some hearsay that maybe Fair Acres wasn't always as welcoming to everyone as it should be. <laughs> and um, Omar Robinson decided to buy up property near the high school, near what's now the high school. First, he bought along East Enon Road, and he became known for building very solid, very square, um, strong-boned homes, um, mostly one level, sometimes with basements. But he built and sold those along East Enon Road, and then turned the corner and started going up West South College Street and then bought an interior tract of land which became known as Omar Circle. And it was developed in two phases, um, section one and section two. So uh, I, I'm lucky that I got to meet Omar because he was my dad's next door neighbor. And um, he had, his wife's name was Barbara. And the only way you could get to Omar Circle was by going through Barbara Court <laughs> off of West South College. So, um, so first East Union and then West South College, and once he had enough money to acquire the property and build in Omar Circle, he created, created Omar Circle, Circle Section 1 and Section 2. And if a book is not already being written about him, um, I, I encourage you or anyone you know who are good writers to consider writing a book about him because he really did something great. And, um, you know, sometimes it takes, uh, it takes the test of time and history to look back and realize what an amazing thing was done at a certain time. <clears throat> so, so then thinking about Central, North End, South End, West End, um, Usually, houses that are, are newer than 1950 or so are going to be not so much in the central area and much more in those other three areas. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about <coughs> um, Tecumseh because I'm a fan of Tecumseh. The, he wasn't ever a Shawnee chief but he was a Shawnee general, I think. And he had a settlement south of Yellow Springs um, in what's now called Old Town. And the reason it's called Old Town is it was the old Shawnee town. And it was bigger than our village, which can only be called a village because it's under 5,000 people. Um, Tecumseh's town had 5,000 or more people, which was supposedly the largest Native American settlement east of the Mississippi. And when the first white settlers came through, 
Uh, one of them had the name Galloway, and the Galloway expedition met with Tecumseh, and I know some of this because Pat Seymour's late husband, Ron, was a, was a journalist and historian, and he kept records of what had occurred on their property, which I later sold, and it's about halfway between um, Yellow Springs and Old Town, and purportedly Tecumseh courted their, uh, the daughter of the Galloways in the, at the spring house of that property. And I got to learn from the Seamers that Tecumseh had told those first white settlers that, um, you know, they had their reasons for choosing to have that big town where they did, proximity to the river, etc. <coughs> but he told them that um, a few miles north, there was a place where water, where water flowed over yellow rocks. And <coughs> they knew from their oral tradition, either the Adena or the Hopewell had um, chosen to build a very small mound I guess just to the southeast of the village, of the, um, I just realized, I really need water. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to start coughing if I don't. <coughs> Excuse me. You'll get some of my germs, but uh, the lips have only been on the... <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Don germs are dying. Don germs. <laughs> <laughs> have, have you read the, the uh, biography of uh, uh, Mills? I have not read it. Uh, I, <coughs> I should up, read it. <laughs> the library a couple of years ago. It's really interesting. Yeah. He had the point broke. Um, right. But, but uh, um, his, Thank you why, so much. Uh, his outline is very true to what it is the way he plotted out the streets. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Turned out very true. So, how is today? Well, one interesting thing that I never understood was why do we have West South College, East South College, West North College, West or West Center College, East Center College? It just seems ridiculous and <clears throat> throws off a lot of people. But the early planners were thinking, well, all college streets lead to the college, and if you are the, on the southernmost one, <laughs> then it's South College, and if you're on the west side of Zenian Avenue, it's West South College, and on the north side, or on the east side, it's East South College, and so forth. Um, once you explain that, or once somebody explains it to you, as Mom probably explained it to me, it all makes sense. But before that, if you think, well, why isn't it Southwest College, or or, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, that's nice. That's so nice, oh, Karen. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm sorry I should have thought of that. Not at all. I really appreciate What's it. What's wrong with my turn? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm happy me. with both. I'll probably use both. Um, oh, so Tecumseh also reportedly told those first white settlers that a couple miles south of them, they called the place of the Devil Winds, which now we have a Devil Winds brewery in Xenia, so I'm, I'm sure that that's a widely known story. But <clears throat> it's interesting to me that Tecumseh and his group certainly already knew long before our famous Xenia tornadoes um, that, that there were some wind current issues yeah. in the area. <laughs> so um, he knew what he was talking about. Um, lots of times people will wonder about the history of their historic home. And um, Julius Cohn was a traveling cartographer who came through Yellow Springs in 1855, or maybe he came through before then, but in 1855, the then village government hired him to make a map 
of the existing homes in Yellow Springs. And so sometimes when we're not sure how old the house is, and I'll come back to that, um, sometimes we tell people that they might go to Antiochiana and see if their house shows up on the Chrome map. Um, the the uh, Green County Historical Society is also a good source of information for people who have historic homes. Um, often I work with buyers who say, boy, there were a lot of houses built in this area in 1900, and there weren't. Um, it, that's what happened when um, Green County converted to a computer system. If they knew that a house was older than um, you know, 100 or so years, and, but they didn't know exactly when the house was built, they just put 1900 in as the, as the date of origin. So if I see a property record that says the house was built in 1900, then the next step is maybe Antiochiana or the Historical Society. Um, we don't usually do that work as realtors, but we advise people how to find out more. Um, the Village Planners and Planning Commission did a great job of ensuring that we would be a little island in a sea of green, but the problem with that, of course, is that we're a little island in a sea of green, <laughs> and so <laughs> we um, often have to debate about if we're going to grow and if we're going to invite more people who want to be here and you know to support the school system, etc., then how are we going to do that? And I think the consensus has been that infill is really the only way we can do that. So that's why you hear a lot about infill in Yellow Springs. Um, I put Coldwell Banker up at the top <coughs> because our advertising, we, we have very strict rules as real estate agents. We're not independent um, free agents. We all have to hang our license with a brokerage. And so my license is hung with Cobalt Banker Heritage. And so mom and I are considered agents of Cobalt Banker Heritage. And um, as as you can see, these are really just rough notes, but um, I wanted to be sure to hit on some of the things that I often get asked about by people who are buying or selling homes in this area. Um, while we're on layout and um, you know, geography, 45387 and the Yellow Springs School District are not always the same set in a diagram. Um, Mom taught me that the parcel ID, which is um, a, a number assigned by the county, um, if it starts with, an, with F19, that means it's in the village proper. If it's F16, that means that it's not within the village limits, but it's within Miami Township and it may also be within the school district because mom first came here as um, the elementary school kindergarten teacher or she was filling in for the then um, kindergarten teacher who took maternity leave and then mom ended up with the position. So for years, I heard from people, I'd meet people in town and they'd say, oh, we love your mom. She sold us our first house. Or, we love your mom, she was our kindergarten teacher. <laughs> so, I, I think that was lucky for me because she was able to teach me in the same patient, kind way that she taught her kindergartners uh, some of the things that I needed to learn about real estate. So, um, F16, F19, oh, and the Yellow Springs School District, uh, I don't know if you recall that you attended a meeting at the superintendent's office where they had a big map of Yellow Springs and 
Xenia Township, Miami Township, um, Bath Township, and they had to determine, they had to decide what was going to be the Yellow Springs School District. And they decided after much debate that the best thing to do, because they didn't want to exclude anybody who was already enrolled in school, was just to take a big magic marker and <laughs> draw a very irregular line around all the houses that currently had students enrolled in the Yellow Springs School District. <laughs> so, so I try to tell my clients to be careful because four five, a 45387 address doesn't always mean that you're in the Yellow Springs School District, um, nor does it tell you wh which township you're in. So um, they're not mutually exclusive, but they're also not mutually inclusive. Um, before getting my license, before deciding to get my license, I asked mom, well, I didn't have to ask her what does a realtor actually do, but I did ask her, what job do you think is really most like that of a realtor? And anybody want to guess? <laughs> Lawyer. That's a good one. Sometimes we're almost like, you know, miniature real estate related advisors in a way that attorneys are, but realtors haven't passed the bar and we can't give tax advice so we haven't earned our CPAs. We really only have our real estate licenses. But in trying to decide whether I really wanted to get my license and, oh, oh. Like a salesman? Another good, good, uh, definitely a good assumption. And I think that was the assumption that I made for 30 years that said, no, I'll never, ever, ever become a <laughs> realtor. Um, I just, I didn't see myself as a salesperson and couldn't imagine myself as a salesperson. Now, when I, when I joined my husband in business and started learning that you could actually sell things and it wasn't that, that hateful, um, that helped change my thinking. But any other ideas? Psychologist. That's, that's a very good answer because I have been asked a couple of times why I'm not allowed to prescribe, <laughs> particularly anxiety drugs, because sometimes the real estate roller coaster can be very anxiety provoking and intense. Um, so that's a good answer. But mom's answer was, I think, kind of ingenious. She said, it's most like being a symphony conductor. Because there are a whole lot of people involved, <laughs> and somebody has to make sure that everybody starts at the same time and finishes at the same time, and somebody has to encourage when this section is a little too quiet, and call when this section is getting a little bit too intense, and for every one real estate person that you work with, there are usually at least 20 also working behind the scenes because when you think about it, there are appraisers and their staff, realtors and their office staff, uh, title companies and their staff, surveyors and their staff, of course, lenders and banks and their staff. And um, the realtor's job Many people don't see what we spend our time doing. They only see us when we show up to show a house or put a sign in the yard. But um, it is a, another, another guess sometimes from people who have just gotten into the field is OBGYN. Because sometimes it feels like that. You get calls in the middle of the night, calls early in the morning. You have to work with people who have conventional jobs uh, because they're the people who can afford to buy houses, but then you also have to be—you uh, I mean, have to be available when they're not working. So you have to be available on weekends and nights, and sometimes early mornings, and and then. But then you also have to be available during the times when the title companies and the banks and the surveyors, etc., are working. 
So um, we, we do a lot of different things. Um, I asked mom if she thought that real, the, the field of real estate would die out because of the onset of, of computers. And mom said, dear, three dimensions are always better than two. <laughs> Which is another great. Sometimes, mom, I want to make bumper stickers of the things you say to me. <laughs> so be careful what I say. <laughs> well, um, I think uh, maybe the last thing I'll say now is that many people confuse the term broker, agent, and realtor. Um, a broker is is the brokerage itself, and they usually have to have one person who, for whom the buck stops here. And that person has spent more years in the business and gotten a higher level of education and ongoing continuing education than a real estate agent. And there are people who earn their licenses and can technically call themselves real estate agents but they don't choose to become realtors. And realtor and realtor is a little bit like nuclear and nuclear. Um, <laughs> realtors um, do two things. They as ascribe to a higher level, a stricter <coughs> canon of ethics and have to prove that they, that, you know, they have to maintain um, adherence to that canon of ethics, but they also have to pay dues to the local board of realtors, and our local board of realtors is the Dayton area board, but also the Springfield area board. Mm -hmm. And in my case, I'm a licensed member of the Dayton area board, but my partner, uh, Minerva Beery, who lives in Clifton, and whose husband is Alex Beery, the mayor of Clifton, um, she is also a member of the Springfield RIST, which means that all of our listings are advertised in the greater Dayton area, which is now starting to include the very outer reaches of Cincinnati, but also the, the greater Springfield area, which is starting to include the Columbus um, <coughs> So, um, so we are realtors rather than agents, but we have not yet earned our broker's licenses the way Mom eventually earned <coughs> her broker's license. So I'm lucky that I got to learn from a broker yeah. in my own household. I think that that wraps up most of what I had to say. Outstanding. Can I start questions? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you, you've been active in this for 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you compare right now to those years? Um, for the 30 years before I got my license, I often heard mom say that we have a very limited housing market in all categories. We don't have very many rentals. We don't have very many first-time home buyer opportunities. We don't have very many mid-range or high-end or luxury opportunities. And so for about 30 years, I would hear mom talk to people about getting pre-qualified and figuring out what their budget really was. And then if they were lucky, she she was able to say, would you like this house or this house? Um, during periods of stability, Yellow Springs just doesn't have very much on the market. Now, when I got my license, we were, we were in a nationwide, what, what was called a bubble, but our, um, the director of training at the Dayton Area Board said that here, it wasn't really a bubble. We were affected by the bubbles, but he said, if you think about the human body, you know, the, the bubbles happen out on the extremities, you know, the, the East Coast, the West Coast, the Florida, but where are we? We're in the heartland. 
And what happens in the heartland? Ba-dum, 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 ba-dum. <laughs> so um, that, that's always stayed with me because I think that's very true. And while we, in Yellow Springs, when I first got my market and we were, we were experience kind of, experiencing kind of a boom, um, there were sometimes as many as 50 properties on the market. And that's because so many people wanted to take advantage of the bubble or the boom that they were, you know, hey, if somebody's willing to buy my house here for 300000 and they're coming from Seattle, where they're getting 600000 for their house, hey, I'll sell it to them. So we usually have more houses on the market during a boom, but then in 2007, when we experienced a bust and the Great Recession, um, we also had more than usual properties on the market because many people had to sell or overextended. And um, so I, I've really seen it. I've seen the boom, I've seen the bust, and now we're really going back to that, you know, slow, steady, ba dum, ba dum, ba dum. And so there are only 23 properties on the market right now. And if you look at, um, at the top, the top number, the top category is um, the MLS, the multiple listing number. And then um, the oh, and, and that's interesting because. Those numbers mostly start with a seven, but if something's been on the market a really long time, like some of those last listings on in Birch Three, um, <coughs> excuse me, those are those are land listings, but there are really only three of them left. There were people who said, "Oh, they'll never sell all those properties in Birch Three, but they're almost gone, and there are just three lots left now." Um, the next, the next number is ST or category is ST, which is status. And if it says A, it means active. If it says PB, it means pending, but you can show it for backup. Now, why would we show a house that is already sale pending? That was a hotly debated category, and it was added within the last couple of years because. In the, let's see, in the symphony, <laughs> when, when you have a long piece of music and you have, you know, different movements, there are, there are um, natural pauses or natural breaking points that occur, and that's true in real estate, in a real estate transaction, too. I often say it's, it's an event, it's not an event, it's a process. And so in the process of selling a home, there are contingencies that have to be met, like financing, inspections, uh, appraisal, uh, title, and then sometimes there's a sale of home contingency, although those are not very common anymore because they, they just um, throw too many wrenches in the process. <coughs> but if we know that there are natural weak spots, then Sellers logically um, want us to continue marketing and showing their properties in case there's a fall through. And so the PB is a new category that says it is sale pending, but you can show it for backup. And sometimes you'll see a, a B for back on market at when something, either the financing or the title or the um, survey or. Uh, Inspections have fallen, caused it to fall through. What does um, that little arrow mean? Oh, it means a, dr a price drop. <coughs> what? A price drop. Okay. So those have been on the market and they've recently dropped in price. Um, sometimes I'll do a sort in consecutive order of price because that sort of helps separate the land from the from the houses also. But I just didn't think to do that before I printed this. I, I, I did this this morning right before, <laughs> right before this. Um, in, in the shop, sometimes we have kids or teenagers who 
make mischief. And Eddie used to always say, that's your karma. Because I was a very naughty kid and an early teenager. And um, whenever something like this happens, I think about like you know, being asked to speak at the last minute. I think this is my karma too, because I procrastinated <laughs> so much during college <laughs> that I have to throw together a lot of my <laughs> a lot of my papers and presentations. Sam, could you discuss um, the effect of the aging population in Yellow Springs on future housing opportunities for? people moving to Yellow Springs? Well, <clears throat> um, houses are like people. Um, we, houses and people like a lot of attention. And sometimes when we don't get proper attention, things start to break down. And so we have an aging population of people, but we also have an aging population of homes. And so um, that affects our market. Similarly to Oakwood, I think Oakwood would be the closest. Um, appraisers often look at um, areas in terms of the, the size and housing stock. And um, so we have some similarities with Oakwood in that it's, lim it's limited and our population of homes is an aging population of homes. Many millennials really like doing other things with their time than taking care of <laughs> um, decrepit houses. And so um, I think one, one thing that um, it's true that as people age out of homes, those homes will become available, but those homes often also need extra attention and have some deferred maintenance issues that affect their value and affect their desirability. So that's, that's a concern, and it's something that people need to be aware of on both the buying and the selling end. Um, there, there are some terms that you only hear if you're really an insider in an industry and, and one I've heard that's sort of shocking but it's also kind of true. Um, sometimes appraisers call a street or a town a buy and die community. And that means you buy and then you never move again until you die. And Many people feel that way about Yellow Springs. They've traveled the world over, and they love Yellow Springs, and this is where they want to be, and they're going to be here until they're not here anymore. So um, that's, that's very common. Um, it makes me sad that we don't have more opportunities for our village elders to, you know, I, I wish we could expand Friends Care Center. I wish we could have more, um, you know, patio homes would be a wonderful thing. In some communities, they're, they're known as lock and leave. Sometimes it's a, a, a quadplex instead of a duplex. It would be um, one building that has four, almost like a four-leaf clover, um, four living units. We just don't have the space here for that kind of thing. What is happening with Antioch and its plan to develop some of its open land? Um, and what is ever going to happen with what I would call the car property? Mm -hmm. uh, um, <laughs> right, right around God Park. There's how many acres there? There's probably 20 acres there. It's just mm -hmm. woods. And uh, just who owns that? What's that? It's just five in one block. OK. Well, oh, there's only five acres. Okay. Yeah, but still, a, a nice, uh, a nice, nice piece of land. But I'm curious. You know, Antioch had, you know, has a, a vision, and I'm wondering if there's any movement uh, in terms of developing residential uh, property around the college. Um, Mom and Bob and I attended a, mm -hmm. a talk um, about two years ago, 
there are some locks that are available. Antioch is willing to experiment with a model that many, um, many nursing homes use, which is they retain the land, but allow people to, um, you know, basically buy and build a property or build a dwelling on that land. And often it's easiest done as a planned use development or a PUD. And so my understanding is that, that the Education Village or Antioch Village, I don't remember what the, what the name of it was, I, um, that would be a really good topic for a future discussion. And you could maybe invite Dr. Kevin Magruder is very involved. He's a real estate expert and also teaches history at the college. And yeah, you know him, you know Kevin. I didn't know he was a real estate expert. I, didn't, <laughs> right. I know. Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah. Uh, he spoke this last one. Oh, he did? Yeah, yeah exactly. But not on this topic. Not on real okay. estate, so we'll have to have well, and, and uh, Malta von Matheson was um, one of the leaders of that. And I think Monica Hasek was also, um, but unfortunately she's now leaving to go to the West Coast for a while, but I'm sure she, there's somebody filling in. But we're... Um, I wasn't going to add anything. I have another question. Is that, are you done with that one? I guess for now. <laughs> no. Nobody knows about the car property. They, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, they they have sold off some portions of it okay. to people who are probably going to build retirement homes for themselves. Mm -hmm. okay. So there are some large parcels of property that um, have been on the market. Um, the village owns a lot of them. Glass Farm. Um, what do you think the prospects are for um, if there are large? Developments built. I mean, obviously, much larger than Birch Three. That was that was tiny. Um, for buyers to be out there, um, you know, nobody's really currently marketing. At least, I'm not marketing moving to Yellow Springs because there isn't enough product to to do that. So, um, although I think in helping the realtors by just all the other work we do. But so, what do you think? I mean, do you think that you know that this community can handle the potential of hundreds of new homes being built? I think um, the laws of supply and demand are powerful natural laws. And we, we do, traditionally we've always had more demand than we have had supply. And so it's an important question for um, villagers and our government to decide how we want to grow and change because growth and change is a natural occurrence too but there are some hard hard questions that have to be answered you know affordable housing and green belts are almost like two sides of the same coin and and we have always had a housing shortage that's, we've, we've never had a surplus of housing, so. I thought there um, was a secret cabal that set the prices to keep the undesirable zone. <laughs> <laughs> you know who any of those people are? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good ironic question because I think, uh, and there's a grain of truth in how it feels because there are many people who come to me and they love Yellow Springs. They love everything that Yellow Springs stands for and they want to be in Yellow Springs. But they either can no longer afford to be in Yellow Springs, they, you know, they may have property they've inherited and they just can't keep up with the, the taxes and the utilities and insurance, or they may be, you know, they want to be here, but there's, it's, it's a, it's a conundrum. How how do we how do we house everybody who would like to be here? Can I wouldn't a, wouldn't so another hundred new houses given away to people for free increase the unaffordability? How are you going to give away free houses? I have a magic wand. Oh, I didn't know that. Right. So when I when I wave it and those hundred houses appear, won't the affordability quotient you know, won't the affordability go down even more than it already is? Um. 
That's not usually how it works. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Jonathan Brown, who built quite a few houses in town, um, he said, I can't explain it, but I've never been able, or not just I, uh, him speaking, but he's never seen more than 12 new built houses sell in a year in Yellow Springs, which is contradiction, is contradicts what I think of as market and demand. And then look at Birch 3, we thought it would just fill right up, and it's taken uh, 15 years. I think that if it, building a house is something that a lot of people just don't have the wherewithal to do. I, I think that, that it's, it's just a different equation from going and buying an existing house. Um, the financing can be different. I think it's, I think, so, but we're talking new houses. So what would you say, Sam? You, you've already said that we're lacking everything, that we have a low supply of everything. That is also what the housing needs assessment said. Um, what do you think is the biggest need, though, <coughs> within that, as far as, as far as price point um, or type of house? Um, well, that's a that's a bigger question than it would appear to be on its face. I think our big thing we need are single family homes. I don't think anybody here really understands what the hell has happened to the demographics of this village. I was on the school board in 71. We had a stepson who was a senior, 119 seniors in 71. In June of 2018, we graduated 54. I think we now have maybe 70 seniors, mainly not from people moving in, but because adjoining school districts, if we have room, can bring their children and their state money to Yellow Springs, and we are encouraging that. We also lose 70 of our own students to private schools, to Montessori, to Antioch School, Dayton schools, Catholic schools, private schools, home school. But we are in a rapidly aging community, and we are not talking single-family homes at all, because generally there's not much room to put them. We are talking now senior housing. And all of a sudden, I know someone in council oh, two or three meetings ago said, the last 10 years we haven't moved hardly ahead with senior housing. But that is changing so rapidly, you better hang on to your hat. Uh, Home Inc. has just built a four unit on Dayton Street. Right across the street, someone's got a double. They just completed that. Home Inc. is going to put 14 to 16 units on less than two acres right across the street from my nine apartments on, on Woodrow. <coughs> Antioch College is really going to build eight units, four two-bedroom and four one-bedroom on the corner of Livermore and East North College. They're going to be wonderful. The, the back sides of the houses are going to be on the streets. Everyone's going to have porches. We're going to have center walkway, lots of landscaping. I think it's a great deal. It'll get built because Antioch doesn't have any money, but they are donating the land, which they'll probably hold. And if you want to be there, you, 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 pay, the, you pay the contractor to build it. Now they're talking 54 units behind the firehouse. And I think you'd better be very careful on that. Be careful what you wish for. That is a lot of units. And I think we've probably got 150 rental subsidized units in town already. So just the population, not only are we aging now, we build all these units. We are really going to age greatly. And we got no place to put new families and new students. So I think this community needs a wide-ranging discussion on what we want to be. Do we want to be an, an, an eclectic retirement community with a college that may or may not be here? 
the issue is still out. They've got 100 students. We all know they need more than that. And they're working hard and they have a litany of excellence that is known throughout this country. But somehow they have not been able to capitalize on this magical history that was Antioch College. So this community is changing. It's changing economically. It is being filled with people that have reached fairly good economic success. And on the other end, we are filled with a lot of people who have never reached it and never will. And the middle class is being squeezed. I don't have, I don't have 11 apartments. My, my oldest daughter now has eight because she bought Betty Ford's six unit on Xenia Avenue. She's got a waiting list. I've got a waiting list. And yet, we have a lot of people that can't afford anything in town. I know, they rent from me. They double up, they triple up. Uh, so we're really we're gonna figure out man. some of these demographics because we are immersed <coughs> in change that's gonna hit <coughs> us very, very rapidly in the next 10 years. In 10 or 20 years, most of us will be dead. And I don't oh, have well. the answer, but oh, you've gotta get it on the table. Up. Oh, well, here's the table. I just want to remind people that about five years ago, when there was an effort to build a lot of multi-units on what was the old Fog property on Dayton Elk Springs Road, and that that unit was, was going to serve a lot of different needs, <coughs> and there was a huge out, outcry for not adding and it, that was, it was reported that's way out of the town. It'll never be a part of the village. Well, they said the same thing about Fair Acres when they built Fair Acres. That it was way out of town. It would never be a part of the village. And so the village has a reputation within itself and also outside itself for not wanting to add any more housing. And, and that particular... Um, effort really added a lot of diversity in, in, in the planning and jumped through a lot of hoops and at the very last minute the people who were objecting to it finally admitted that it didn't matter what the builder came up with they were not going to accept it and it was dishonest and why would a builder want to do it? Why would a builder try it again? I think we have a lot of history to overcome. A lot of history and a lot of complexity. Things are, are particularly with housing and with village government, are very rarely binary, truly binary. It's usually much more complicated than, than it seems. One thing I'd like to say, though, about the people who have been coming to town and have been going um, or, or staying, um, one way I know that we have a wonderful village is every, everybody I talk to is convinced that their neighborhood is the best neighborhood in Yellow Springs. <laughs> because there's a sense of community, the neighbors all talk to each other, there's a bonfire at Halloween, and I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful part of our community that we have so much pride in our little village and so many people who do love our little village and want to be here. So that's, that's a happy note, um, but it also um, comes with some responsibility to think through the complexities and figure out how to continue to be inclusive and be the kind of community that we want to be. Sometimes I think too many of us are just too damn smug on what we have. <laughs> and they, they see this utopia, and it certainly could be. And the promise is certainly here, and the history is here. But we have managed to push racial discrimination under the surface. It's here, but it's not on top of the table, it's buried. 
economic discrimination is here. We don't know about it. Uh, the police department knows more about anybody because they're all over town. And we've got problems in our police department that we've got to change for a small town. We've got a lot of problems that we have to admit we have. We have more drugs than we need. We have more young people with no jobs that we need. It's tough to live in Yellow Springs at eight bucks an hour. It's tough all over at 10 bucks an hour. But anyway, we have problems we have to face up. I think village government has acknowledged a lot of them. They have changed the zoning where lots sizes have gone smaller and smaller. I think 50 feet of frontage when it used to be much more than that. Uh, they've cut down the square footage. They have changed. You can put a, an accessory building on a piece of land as long as you own it. I see them going up here and there. So people are aware. That we, we, we are landlocked now with green space. Some is our making, some isn't. We have this wonderful glen, 1,100 acres, that anchor one side. We have Whitehall Farm anchoring one side. And now we just sold eight parcels at public auction by Arnabits uh, beyond the high school. But that pretty much has got us enveloped with green space. And with green space, to buy green space, it goes high, and yet if you want to get conservation easement money from Tecumseh, Lanchester, or wherever, you have to pledge you're allowed one parcel or one building. So if you're going to put on one building, you're going to need financial support someplace. So money is pouring in to allow this green space to happen, but it can't happen any longer because it's about done. So we either have to build up, we have to build smarter, we have to build more multi-units, more, uh, more doubles, more, I heard, uh, the quadruplexes. Qu quadruplexes. There, there's a lot of humanity and a lot of neighborliness in these kind of ideas. But we still have a lot of land that we've got to talk about. One of is the car property. One is the Nahez property. Mm -hmm. Nahez wanted two more buildings 30 years ago, and, I said, and zoning denied it said you would overload the neighborhood. Well, it's time to rethink some of these parcels that are here. Some of these parcels, the Nahez is huge. You could put 12 stores there. Someone's got to convince the school system you've got half the goddamn people you had 30 years ago. Why do you have the whole block for Mills Lawn when you've just built an addition that's not even paid for yet and you've got 40% fewer students. There is $2 million of the real estate along Phillips Street, as far as I'm concerned. need to wind this down. Okay, right. all right, well. Uh, so, but the, these last two have statements. Have question, okay, okay. one more question, and then I have okay. next month. What I'd just like to know, Sam, is, is being someone, I, I'm your poster child. I just moved here from San Diego because Yellow Springs is where I want to be, spend the rest of my life. Um, and because I wanted to be a part of a community, and it's very difficult to find that in the United States these days, mm -hmm. and I've definitely found it here. But again, my frustration comes to what can I afford to potentially live in, in you know, moving on to to my older days. The fact that none of us in here are under 55 and are the interest of who yellow, you know, who's interested in real estate here in Yellow Springs says a lot. But as as, as um, of somebody who's really interested in this, how can I keep track of what's happening in Yellow Springs as far as real estate goes? What you know, I'm not prepared at this time to hire a, a realtor moving forward, but I'm really interested in how, what comes on the market, what doesn't. I, I don't think that the... Zillow, yeah, I've been doing Zillow, but it seems like there's a lot missing in, in, in that as well. So what is the best, best methods of learning how things are? Because a lot of times I'm seeing that housings, houses are selling without ever going on, on the market. It's like between happening between individuals and stuff like that. Um, how do we know about that? Well, buyers, buyers don't actually hire realtors because the seller always pays the commission. 
And so if you have or if you made acquaintance with a realtor that you like and feel comfortable with, any of us can put you on an automatic email list with the multiple listing service. And I say that's a way to keep your finger on the pulse of the market. Okay. It just you get an email automatically anytime something goes on the market, off the market, sale pending or sold. And all the information goes to the MLS, which is like the, the source of all of the information. And then it trickles down depending on how much people have paid through Zillow or Realtor.com or any of the brokerages or HomeSnap, Trulia. I mean, there are literally hundreds of places that you can you can go to seek out information. But if you work with a realtor who signs you up you know, to, to get those automatic emails, then you know at the same time all the other realtors and their clients know. And, and it does, it's a healthy way. I recommend it to sellers too. You don't get that many emails because we don't have that much property. Um, and we're in a time of sort of slow, steady, you know, pulsing, which is why we only have 23 to 30 properties on the market, you know, 20 to 30 properties instead of 40 to 50 properties during a boom or a bust. But any, any time um, that you're watching the market, it's not going to be a big market to watch because it's so little. And um, any, any realtor will be happy to, to put you on that emailing list. And okay. of course, I'd be happy to if you'd like me to. Thank you so much. Um, next month, <laughs> the uh, president of Village Council, Brian Hausch, has agreed to come. That's uh, April 24, I believe. Yes, it is. And we can include an extension of this discussion. Uh, he doesn't have a specific topic. Other than 2019 goals of the council. Yeah. Well, I know there'll be yep. police, <laughs> village manager. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All the good things. Housing. There should be a new village manager by then. Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. What's the date again? The 24th. The, oh. Well, the fourth Wednesday. Whenever. Right. Oh. April 24th. Oh, okay. Yeah, you'll know who the village manager is. Right, you will. Right. They will be on. Yeah. I just want to quickly bring people's attention. I realize I didn't write it as large as I meant. That's the uh, Survey Monkey website for the school facilities. Uh, survey they're asking. It's just three quick questions that they're asking. So we really want to thank you, Sam, for coming in. You did an outstanding yes. job. Really.